decades of research are showing impacts of porn on individuals' relationships in society, right? Like we talk about that all the time. But specifically with regard to mental health, research shows porn consumption is linked to poorer mental health, lower self-esteem, poorer body image, and less fulfilling relationships, and more loneliness. So all of the things that, you know, if someone is already experiencing negative mental health outcomes, um, often individuals seek out pornography to cope with these kind of negative feelings. So even if maybe it temporarily relieves that feeling, it often spirals individuals into a cycle um, where they stay in this negative cycle. It often makes it worse over time. And research shows that, personal stories show that. We've spoken with countless individuals who have a had a porn habit that has escalated to the point where it um, made their mental health worse than than it was before they started using porn to cope. Hey, Parker. Hey, Natalie. (laughs) So Parker and I are here today to chat about some of the questions that you, our fighters, have sent in on social media or via email or messaging or whatever it may be. So... Uh, We're going to kind of dive right in. If this sparks any other questions you have for us, please send them our way. Maybe we'll start a series, do this more often. Uh, But for today, we wanted to kind of get started with the questions you've sent. So a little context. Do you want to tell people who you are, what your role is here? Yeah. uh, So I'm Parker. Uh, I oversee public outreach at Fight the New Drug. So I oversee our presentation program and some curriculum and resource development. Um, and I do live events as part of that um, and see some of the questions that we commonly get asked at live events. Um, and in the past, I've been involved with answering questions that we get uh, over social media and things like that as well. So, yeah. Awesome. Some of the questions we did get were about live events. So, so glad you're here to tell us about some of your experiences you've had. Um, one thing we were asked was what are some common themes parents are dealing with that you hear about at live events? That's actually a really, uh, thoughtful question. I'm glad that someone asked that because, uh, the trend recently, um, so I do want to say some of the things that we may talk about today because of some of the questions we got, they may be heavy. Um, so maybe just like a little bit of a warning for anyone listening, um, but recently at live events, especially community events where we're mostly talking to adult audiences and parents, the trends that we're seeing are parents are concerned because kids are more frequently being uh, victims of sextortion scams. So if, if you don't know what that is or you haven't heard of sextortion before, essentially the most common thing is someone contacts a minor on social media that are pretending to also be a minor. Right. Uh at some point that that conversation evolves to the point where they're exchanging nudes or something of that nature and they're trying to get them to send nudes and they may have sent nudes that aren't of them they may have had child sexual exploitation material that they send to make it seem like they're also minor and once that youth sends them that content they basically have already often found like their family Mm -hmm. through their social media things like that and they basically blackmail them into saying hey if you don't send us money right now um, we're going to send these pictures to your, your parent, to your friend. We're going to post them. We're going to tag you like your life will be over. Right. Um, and unfortunately these scams, um, are really difficult for youth. They feel like they can't talk to their parents. Um, a lot of times it leads to self-harm or attempted self-harm, uh, before the parent finds out. Uh, but this is something that we're commonly hearing about yeah. at events, um, is that parents are really concerned about this issue because it's too easy for anyone anywhere in the world to contact their their child and right. to try to convince them that they're someone they're not right. and then to blackmail them. And, and when they do send money, they just keep asking for more. And right. when they don't, they blackmail them. Or when they stop sending money, they, they attempt to blackmail them. And, and these youth feel like their life is over um, and, and that often leads to self-harm. So... That's one of the things that we're commonly hearing about. We would strongly encourage parents to be having these conversations yeah. with their kids um, and to recognize that there's nothing better that you can do for your children than to have open, honest, and frequent conversations yeah. with them. Yeah, 100%. And I think it's important to note, too, that like not every instance where young people are exchanging nudes or sexually explicit material are 
in scenarios where they're being extorted. And so that's why part of the reason why this behavior has become so normalized yeah. that it is more normal for once a, a young person is groomed by someone in this situation to send something because it's happening often. Um, we have this stat here that nearly 50%, 46.8% of youth report having received a sexted image. So like, and that's just what's been reported, right? But this is something that we are hearing a lot. We are um, hearing a lot from young people and from ad adults in schools. And this is something that's happening really frequently. Um, and it's it's part of the reason that conversations, healthy conversations are so important for yeah, parents and absolutely. trusted adults to be having with yeah. young people. And, you know, if you want more information, just search the term sextortion on our blog. There's some great articles you can read. Um, another stat, one of the articles that you, you'll find when you search that is that one in four sextortion vic victims from a recent survey are 13 or younger. Yeah. Um, so clearly this is an issue. Yeah. And that's something, too. I mean, part of the reason parents are asking about this at live events are because they're wanting to know any parents listening what can you do? Healthy conversations are always the most important thing. Um, making sure you're a safe person for a young person to come to, to know they're not going to get in trouble if they're in a situation like this. Um, but to also know what things you can do as kind of parameters. So being really aware of what is on social media or on a device before you grant access to a device to, to young people, having some boundaries around how that's used. Um, and healthy kind of digital safety tips within your family Absolutely. to make sure it's being used responsibly and, and helping them navigate this digital world in a way that's safe for them as well. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, those are things, unfortunately, that we're hearing at live events recently. But, um, you know, hopefully the resources that we provide and yeah. um, the things we've mentioned can help parents to better handle these situations, to be prepared. Um, and to find direction if they find themselves in this situation. You know, if, if this happens, it doesn't mean that you did anything wrong. And yeah. Natalie mentioned um, kids need to feel like they're not in trouble. It doesn't mean that there can't be consequences when uh, we're trying to help raise kids. Of course. Uh, but it means that, you know, the most important thing is that you want them to keep being honest with you. Yeah. And you want them to come back to you time and time again. And we want them to know above all else that they're loved. Yeah. Um, and so those are just what we're saying, take priority in these moments. Yeah, absolutely. And um, just to give a little bit of context, because you mentioned these are things we're hearing at live events. So for anyone who doesn't know, we do live presentations in schools and community groups. Um, often when we present, we'll do kind of a parent and community night bef the night before and then youth presentations the next day. So these are some of the questions we're getting from parents and community members, educators who are attending those presentations the night before, um, but what are some questions that you're getting from youth when when we have these youth presentations um, in schools or community groups? Yeah, it's interesting. With uh, youth presentations, it kind of goes the other way. With parents, there's these bigger issues that they're really concerned about um, that are real problems and that we want to get them solutions for. But with kids, the thing that we hear over and over again, especially recently, like in the last year, um, and you know we do countless events every year, yeah. um, the thing we hear over and over from youth is that they're so glad that someone's talking to them about this finally. Yeah. Uh, they don't feel like it's being talked about at school, in their home, you know, that none of the things, none of their village, whatever that kid's village is, they don't feel like they're getting these resources and support yeah. from any of those other sources. Um, and so they're just ultimately the biggest feedback is they're so grateful someone is yeah. finally talking about this. And that's what we hear over and over and over yeah. again. And I think that's, imp I mean, we started doing presentations in 2011, in 2011. And I think that's important to note that ever since the first presentation we did, um, kind of what we're reminded every time we present is that like kids know more than we as adults often want to give them credit for knowing. Um, this is something that their lives are inundated with this information, this topic, this content, it's everywhere around them. Um, they know more than we think they know. By us having responsible and appropriate, age-appropriate conversations with them, we're most likely not introducing this to them. They're already aware of this. And they're so grateful to have resources 
to appropriately know how to navigate these things because they're already dealing with them and otherwise they're kind of dealing with them on their own. So I think it's an important reminder that they know more than we think they do or we want to believe that they do. Yeah. And that's just the nature of these kids growing up in the digital age, right? Like someone who's graduating high school this school year is graduating in 2025. And that means that they were born in 2007. Yeah. So their parents were likely an age where they were born in the late 70s, early 80s. And around the time they're having kids is when social media and the first smartphones became available. Yeah. And so they don't, they're exposed to that as an adult. Like we're not yet at a point where people who had these things as kids have kids who are in middle school and high school. Like we're not there yet. And so many of these parents um, just are kind of unaware of some of the issues that uh relate to these topics they're unaware of the resources as well and that's that's ultimately why we want to get this information out there's a gap in understanding what this issue really looks like for young people today because it's not the same as it looked for exactly those parents when they were that age so bringing parents up to speed really helping adults educators the the adults who are in these young people's lives understand what these issues are and then make sure we're prepared to help prepare them to navigate this world exactly yeah yeah and you know that goes to one of the other questions that we got was um how does pornography impact mental health which is something we obviously talk about a lot but what really is the core of that and I, i think that you're really great at speaking to this but um when we're talking about what is the ultimate impact on mental health, because we talk a lot about how it impacts individuals generally, right? right? Like how it can affect various different parts of an individual's life. But right. when we're talking about how it impacts their mental health specifically, what are we seeing in the research and the data? Yeah. And I mean, there, decades of research are showing impacts of porn on individuals' relationships in society, right? Like we talk about that all the time. But specifically with regard to mental health, research shows Porn consumption is linked to poorer mental health, lower self-esteem, poorer body image, and less fulfilling relationships, and more loneliness. So all of the things that, you know, if someone is already experiencing negative mental health outcomes, um, often individuals seek out pornography to cope with these kind of negative feelings. So loneliness, boredom, poor self-esteem. Um, stress, stress, exactly. Porn is often used as a coping mechanism. Um, but, but what it does is even if maybe it temporarily relieves that feeling, it often spirals individuals into a cycle, um, where they stay in this negative cycle. It often makes it worse over time. And research shows that personal stories show that we've spoken with countless individuals who have a, had a porn habit that has escalated to the point where it, um, made their mental health worse than, than it was before they started using porn to cope with that scenario. So I think that's really important for parents to be aware of, um, especially parents who grew up pre-internet pornography um, and and really understanding the difference between having content that is more accessible, affordable, available, and anonymous than it's ever been before in the history of the world where a young person can seek out something um, and at the the click of a button have access to tens of thousands of images and videos and things that um, can escalate in nature over time that can become compulsive that can grow into something um, that has been proven to not help improve mental health Um, and I think that's something mental health is being talked about a lot right now it's something we're obviously aware of as a society um, and pornography has been shown to do anything but help mental yeah. health. So I think it's really important for parents to be aware of that. Um, and for young people to be aware of that too, to yeah. know how this can affect them. Absolutely. Yeah. One of the things I always say with live audiences is it doesn't help in the long run, right? Yes. Um, being lonely, being stressed, being sad, being bored, uh, those aren't fun emotions, but it doesn't mean that they're not normal, natural, and in some yeah. cases healthy. Like absolutely, those are just a part of life. Absolutely. Um, and when we use something to cope with those emotions, it in the long run, uh, the research shows that pornography, using something like porn to cope with those emotions, in the long run, it only further complicates the issues surrounding mental health, like you're talking about. Absolutely. And maybe just to add to that, for anyone who hasn't seen a live presentation or isn't as familiar with the research on this topic. Um, can you talk a little bit about what we share in our presentations with why that is like the brain's response to, um, 
how we train our brains in response to any kind of action or behavior and how that can work positively or negatively for us. Yeah. Um, so essentially in live presentations, we talk about this a lot, but trying to help young people to understand some key functions in the brain, right? So first being that our brains are neuroplastic, that uh, the decisions that we make every day, our brain is trying to ultimately find what's going to keep us happy, healthy, and alive. And so those decisions uh, train our brain towards certain behaviors. Um, this means that someone can develop a struggle with pornography. It also means they can heal from a struggle with pornography Absolutely. because of the fact that the brain literally changes. Uh, and then the other thing we talk about is two kind of uh, key parts of the brain, which is the reward system and the prefrontal cortex. So the reward system essentially drives our desires and the prefrontal cortex it kind of acts like the brakes of the brain. Uh, essentially, it helps keep the reward system in check. Yeah. And with the problem with pornography is we see in the research that when someone consumes porn, it weakens the relationship between the reward system and the prefrontal cortex, meaning the, the prefrontal cortex is less well able to keep the reward system in check. Yeah. And so someone can develop a habit, a compulsive behavior, or even an addiction to pornography. And we want to be clear, as we always are at Fight the New Drug, that not everyone who consumes porn is going to be addicted. That's right. not what we're saying. Uh, but that there's an abundance of research to show that porn addiction is very real. It shares many similarities to addiction to a substance like, say, nicotine that makes cigarettes addictive. And aside from all of that, as many of the listeners know, uh, there are countless people around the world who struggle with pornography. And they, many of them are aware it's impacting their life, yeah. and yet they still can't stop. Yeah. And that's also something to consider when we're not only looking at the research, but the personal experiences to show uh, how porn can impact individuals, their mental health, and those yes. kinds of things. So I think that all of that is important context for how and why a porn habit, especially one that's being used um, as a coping mechanism, coping mechanism yeah. can kind of spiral in a negative direction, but also as a reminder that like we can heal and we can overcome these things because of the way our brains work. Um, so for someone who is struggling or maybe porn has negatively contributed to, to mental negative mental health outcomes, um, we can reverse that, right? Yeah, and absolutely. The brain can heal. Things can get yes. better. You're not alone. Yes. And I think that's an important reminder for anyone absolutely. listening to this. Yeah. And we see that in the research and personal experiences. And if you're ever just lacking a little bit of hope in that journey yeah. because they're, you know setbacks aren't failures, it doesn't mean that this won't get better over time, but it does take time. Um, you know, just go to our website, click videos yeah. and watch a couple of videos. I promise it'll help you feel better seeing people who have been through similar experiences to you and knowing that things can get better over time. Absolutely. Um, now uh, another question that we got that, um, is unfortunately a topic that can be really difficult. Uh, essentially how do we support a partner in quitting porn without ignoring, um, the trauma that people often experience often referred to as betrayal trauma yeah. finding out that a partner has been struggling with pornography and feeling that betrayal and trying to figure out where to go from here and how to help the partner and support the relationship while also finding healing themselves um, and the first thing that i would say about that is that um, i hope those individuals know that they're not alone and this isn't their fault yeah um, this is not a reflection of you or your fault in any way as the partner of someone who's struggling. Um, but instead knowing that, you know, if, if you want to be there to support this person and to help them through this struggle, there are resources and you can still take care of your own yes. needs and mental health and uh, expectations. You can still have boundaries. All of that can Absolutely. still exist. But we understand why that's a question because that can be complicated. Yeah. It feels like you're juggling a lot of things. Yeah. And I think it's, there are a lot of different pieces of this to address. So first of all, um, I would say we often get asked kind of in conjunction with this, you know, should I support a partner or, or yeah. should I not? And I think the first thing to note is like different things are right for different people. Of course. Um, and we're not here to tell you, you know, what is right for you at the end yeah. of the day. Nor should we. Nor should right? we. Exactly. Nor we should wish anyone. we could give you all the answers, yes. but we can't. Exactly. Um, you know, individuals know what is right for them within their relationships. And I think if someone um, chooses to pursue supporting a partner in healing, then it's really important to note that um, it is possible. Uh, you just mentioned a minute ago going to our site, watching some videos. We have many videos of couples who have overcome this together where one partner struggled and another partner with healthy boundaries, um, you know, processed through 
the feelings they had about this on their own, but then supported their partner and they've overcome this and, and they're doing really well. That's absolutely possible. We also hear stories from individuals who choose not to pursue that path and who who decide that it is right for them to go their separate ways. And, and both of those options are okay. There's no right or wrong answer. Um, but one thing that is the most important for a partner of someone who has a pornography habit um, or addiction is to make sure that as the partner, they are taking care of themselves first and foremost along the way. So that um, means having healthy boundaries around what you will and won't do as a partner um, willing to support, having enough support yourself. So whether that's a support system in your life of friends and family, um, having a therapist or a clinical professional who is supporting you um, in this healing journey, you know, betrayal trauma is very real. Um, having, especially for individuals who have, you know, been together or married are in a situation where they find out down the road about something they didn't know about. They feel yeah. that betrayal. It's a very real thing. Um, and there are resources, as you mentioned, to help. Um, but also uh, something you said is to really know that this isn't your fault and it's not about you. And I think Something to remind people is often when an individual struggles with pornography, that struggle begins at such a young age for so many people, right? The porn industry is is um, preying upon, <laughs> um, I don't know if I want to say that in that way. Um, we can say that. Yeah, we can, we can <laughs> say that. The porn industry is preying upon on young people and, and content is created um, to... To, I don't like the way any of this is going. You can restart. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm going to restart. It's fine. Um, individuals who are really young, who are accessing this content at a young age, um, are experiencing this in a way that's becoming compulsive well before they meet their their future partner or the partner who may, maybe they're in a relationship with at this time. So, yeah. Um, that not that's not an excuse um a bit of an explanation of how and why someone might be struggling with something even you know down the road often yeah. we hear from people they say well when i get married i'll stop or when i you know this is just something while i'm single and alone but when i'm in a relationship i'll stop and i think based on what we know from how the brain works that's not always the case yeah. um and so people find themselves in relationships where this is something that comes up and yeah. um yeah, please feel free. Or they to struggle with it in the past and then yes. a trauma occurs or there's some some kind of a trigger in their life. Right. A stressor and they, or yeah, fall back into yes. unhealthy past habits or yes. something like that. And to, again to clarify what you said at the beginning, you're you're only sharing that not to excuse this or to um not for any reason like that, but essentially because we want to remind those partners yes. that this is not your fault and exactly. here's one of the reasons why this person was exposed likely at a very young age yes. uh to this to this content yes and um i think also important to note that um i mean societally porn isn't something that we speak about often that's part of why we exist yeah. right to help break down the taboo around this topic and normalize conversations around this but a lot of people um in dating or relationships um, never talk about pornography. Yeah. Um, and so when it does come up, it's something that people are saying, oh, well, I just assumed you would be fine with this. And the other partner is saying, well, I assumed you wouldn't be fine with it. That's something we hear often. And I think um, a good reminder that this is something we should be talking about as we pursue relationships and navigate relationships. And yeah, great point. Um, for young people, for, you know, if you're, you've been in a relationship for a couple of years and you haven't talked about pornography, and you have feelings about, you know, your boundaries around pornography in your relationship, then open Start that, that conversation. conversation. Yeah. Start it. Have an ongoing yeah. conversation. Um, and a great resource for that is the Conversation Blueprint. Yes. Um, so ftnd.org slash let's talk about porn. Yeah. Um, you can just go to ftnd.org and click Blueprint. You can get access to that. It can help you map out the conversation ahead of time, have icebreakers to help ease some of the anxiety and yeah. uncomfortableness people often feel around the topic of pornography. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to mention that really quickly. Yeah, and it's so. in, it's for anyone who hasn't um, used that resource, it's interactive. So you can yeah. say, I'm a parent and I want to talk to my child, or I'm a partner and I want to talk to my partner, or yeah. I want to talk to a friend. And it or will I kind of educate my mailman on exactly. porn terms, like whatever it might be. Whatever it yeah. is. And it will kind of guide you through um, the best ways to navigate 
conversation based on dynamics as well, um, yeah. which is really helpful because yeah. there is nuance depending on absolutely on the conversation that you're having. And how to pick those conversations up again later because it's yeah. not necessarily healthy or realistic to expect that you're going to cover all of this in yes. one conversation and that this is something you don't ever have to talk about again. Like yes. this is an ongoing discussion, whether it's with your kids, your partner, whatever it might be. Yes. Like this is something that there's so much to this conversation. Yes. And one thing I, I want to add, um, I know this started as a question about supporting a partner and betrayal trauma. And also I'm not sure that we've actually answered how best to support a partner. So we will get to that. But I do just want to say for anyone who is, um, struggling with pornography, maybe as a parent or in their relationship, um, or is the partner of someone who's struggling, often what we hear is that that's a reason people don't talk to their children about it because they think, mm, well, this yes. is something I'm struggling with. Who am I to tell them, you know, how to, how to navigate this issue? You and, better than anyone. Yeah. You are better than anyone because yeah. you understand the impacts that it has. And if anything, you're more qualified to have yeah. this conversation. And Absolutely. so I just want to encourage you to know that, um, that's, that's a great reason for you to be the one having this conversation to say, this is something I've struggled with. Um, and I don't want you to have the same struggle that I have. So I want to, I want to break down those walls. Well, so this is my fault that we went down so many other channels, but (laughs) to go back to the start. So how do we, uh, best support support. that other person? Cause we talked about the betrayal trauma. We talked about some of the other downstream issues and things to be aware of some of the other caution signs, but how do we ultimately support that partner? Yes. Um, great question. I think again, this is kind of a case by case. Um, but number one, make sure you're good to go. You're, you have good boundaries for yourself. That's first and foremost, most important. Um, but number two, I think talking with your partner is part of that. Talking with your partner about, um, you know, the ways that within whatever boundaries you have, you can help provide accountability to them. Um, Noting what resources do they need if they're feeling triggered? Um, do you feel comfortable saying, hey, if you're feeling triggered, come talk to me about it. Let's let's set a precedent that if you're feeling triggered and feeling like you want to pursue this, that you'll come talk to me instead and we'll go for a walk. Or having kind of a plan in place for what to do if and when these things come up. Um, in some cases, it might mean going to counseling or therapy together as a couple to to um, work on opening up that communication within your relationship to navigate this. Um, I think in some cases that means, you know, installing filtration or, um, something to help monitor or, or put some bumpers around, um, access to these, to these things. So there are a lot of really great ways to support a partner if that's what you choose that you want to do. (laughs) Um, and I think, ultimately the best thing is to start with talking with your partner and yeah. and asking them what what they need and what yes. would be most yeah. helpful and supportive for them absolutely so speaking of relationships and porn's impact within relationships and supporting partners struggling with porn um another question we got that we we get often actually is does a partner looking at porn impact a couple's sex life and if so how so yes <laughs> the short answer yes. is yes, the short it does. Answer is yes, yes, it does. Um, so there's numerous issues that we can talk about yeah. with why a partner looking at porn impacts a couple's sex life. Um, one thing just to mention off the start is to our knowledge, there to this day still has not been a single longitudinal study that over time shows in the long term that consuming pornography has any positive benefit for relationships. That's correct. So and that's as start... an individual or together yes, in a couple. Absolutely. Yes. So just to start with that, but jumping in specifically to how does it impact a couple's sex life, uh, a couple issues. So watching porn, it, it fosters negative self-image. Yep. So that's already problematic. There's a higher porn consumption often leads to less sex in relationships. Um, and if I remember right, those findings are not correlational, they're directional. So yes. Uh, the more porn that you consume, the less sex that you're having, meaning it's not just a correlation. There's actually directional findings. Um, and then watching porn can break trust in a relationship. You know, we see that people who consume pornography are more likely to um, be accepting of cheating in a relationship, right. things of that nature. Yeah. And one other thing to note, um, if one partner especially is consuming porn in a relationship, and this is a little bit going back to the question we just covered, um, often the the partner who is not consuming porn, there are effects for them as well. So um, 
it affects their self-esteem. They're yes. they're playing the comparison yes. game. Some of this is associated with betrayal trauma of, oh, well, if my partner, you know, is pursuing someone who looks like that in pornography, I don't look like that. Or someone yes. who is um, interested in or willing to sexually um, pursue these things, I'm not interested in or yeah. willing to pursue those things. So I think that um, there's a lot of comparison that's set up there for partners as well. Absolutely. We've heard that from many people. Research also shows that impact. Um, but that's another way in yeah. which one partner, especially consuming pornography, can yeah, impact. Absolutely. Uh, and and we see even in the personal stories, many partners sharing with us that they feel less interested in sex or less willing to participate or engage in sex yeah. with a partner when they're consuming pornography because they feel that betrayal. They feel alone. Yes. They feel like they're not enough. Um, they are thinking about how their partner is just having an endless array of images that they've been exposed to or are consuming and that's difficult right. to, to want to be engaged with yeah. someone when that's what's on your mind yeah the idea of how could i ever be good enough if if you can search tens of thousands of whatever you want at the end of the day yeah. most of which is not me um Absolutely. and that for the partner who is consuming pornography they're having this experience where they are bonding with a screen as opposed to bonding with their yeah. partner so over time that also can create a rift in Absolutely. relationships um so maybe we can talk about some of the the downstream issues of all this we've talked yeah. about um things that we hear at events we've talked about how it impacts relationships we talked about how to support a partner we talked about betrayal trauma what people are struggling with yeah um but we haven't really talked about some of those downstream effects yeah. yet on the bigger picture. And one of the things, you know, I just did a, a presentation at a college just the other day. And one of the things that especially young people are really trying to wrestle with right now is, quote, ethical pornography. Right. Like, what is ethical pornography? Um, is that even a thing? Is it even possible to create ethical porn? Uh, even if it was possible, are we still going to see the same impacts uh, that the other research shows, right? Um, what about AI pornography? All, all of these right. kinds of things. Um, and if I could, if it's okay, maybe if Please I could do. just kind of give like a, a recap of my thoughts on that and some of the things that we're aware of from yeah. research, and then you can jump in at any time. But one of the, the biggest problems is that, um, first to be clear, even if you could make quote ethical pornography, which let's define that really quick. Right. What is ethical porn? Ethical porn, typically people are trying to say pornography that ensures that people are of legal age consent, uh, there's no sexual exploitation, there's right. no child sexual exploitation material, that people are being paid fairly, that they're being treated fairly, right. that somehow all of these issues that we talk about all the time about how porn impacts our society, um, if we just could solve all right. of that, right? If that was possible, which we'll talk about why it's not, the problem is at the end of the day, it wouldn't fix all of the other things that we talk about. Yes. People would still be impacted by pornography, right? Uh, the fact that it could be habit forming and escalating behavior impacts their right. mental health. It would still impact relationships, what we love, how much we love, how we think about the people we love. And it would still impact our society in the other ways we talk yes. about, uh, whether that's sexism or racism or any of the myriad of issues yes. that we educate on all the time. Um, how we think about and treat people, how that affects our society, if that many people are consuming this kind of content. So we've kind of defined it. We've talked about why even if it was possible, those it wouldn't solve these other problems. But aside from all of that, let's right. address what this even means, what this looks like. Right. And just for anyone who's yeah, listening please. and not watching this video, every time we say ethical porn, we're like doing air quotes yes. with our fingers yeah. because yeah. because we're about to explain. But yeah quote-unquote ethical porn yes it doesn't exist it can't exist okay so we've defined again air quotes ethical yes. pornography um and kind of made clear what exactly we're talking about and then we've talked about how even if ethical porn was possible right. that there are it wouldn't solve the other issues right. that we talk about how it impacts individuals relationships and society but now let's talk about why ethical porn isn't possible and some of those deeper issues yes so first, um, tube sites like Pornhub, mm -hmm. uh, where many people are accessing pornography, we've long known that they uh, are problematic for some of the issues that we frequently talk about. They're known for hosting sexual exploitation material, sex trafficking content, 
um, image-based sexual abuse, commonly referred to as revenge porn, yeah. uh, child sexual exploitation material, commonly referred to as child pornography, yes. right? So if you want to learn more about that, we would encourage you to read Nicholas Kristoff's yeah. op-ed, The Children of Pornhub, that was written for the New York Times a few years ago. Uh, after that came out, literally millions and millions of videos were purged off of that site yes. within 24, 48 yes. hours, something like that. Um, which is so telling, which is so telling so of the telling. kind of content that is available on these yes. sites. Much of that has been known to be reuploaded since, or more content that's of that same exploitative manner has since been uploaded. Yes. That doesn't, that wasn't the same content that was removed, but is still just as problematic. So that's already telling us right away that these tube sites are full of non-ethical right. material, no matter how their marketing department wants you to believe that yep. ethical porn can be created. And then a few other things that we see frequently, right? Um, we see that larger porn production studios often want to do things like an exit interview to ensure right. uh, or at least try to demonstrate that the content was somehow ethically made. So they're right. interviewing performers after to say, hey, were you a willing participant? Or are you comfortable? Are you safe? Were you paid? Did you agree to this contract? Things like yes. that. And filming them on camera answering these questions. The problem is that we have many accounts on our website of former performers or current performers saying, you know, I was essentially forced to yes. say those I things at the end. I wasn't given a choice. I wasn't given a choice. Yeah. I, I wouldn't be paid. I wouldn't yeah. be hired again. Um, they... they wouldn't allow me to leave. Yes. Right. Being threatened with violence threatened if or, I yes. didn't say that I was here willingly. Uh, so then what we find is that people turn to alternatives from these larger uh, porn sites or porn production companies. Yeah. And that leads to things like OnlyFans. Again, the problem with OnlyFans, same things that we're seeing on the tube sites. We see sexual exploitation material, sex trafficking victims videos. Yep. Uh, content of minors, mm -hmm. right? Se uh, child sexual exploitation material. And again, revenge porn mm -hmm. or image-based sexual abuse. So not solving these problems. Uh, we're also seeing people literally being forced to produce content on those sites. Right. Like they have a sex trafficker or a pimp who is forcing them to produce that content and then reaping all of the money. Yes. So huge problems with those. And then the other things we see are amateur pornography. Yep. And one of the things that people want to say is the smaller studios or uh, partners who produce their own content right. are somehow free of this kind of exploitation sure. the problem is that that's not possible actually research uh as far back as 2015 showing yeah. that in order to get people to view that content they the people that are creating this amateur content feel they have to follow the same trends that we see on the tube sites right. but often make that content more extreme sure so the problems that we talk about with extreme content and the way that that changes the way we look at and treat people and it affects our society these smaller companies often in the research we see that they feel they have to uh, create that content and make it even more shocking more right. exploitative in order to get views right, to taken away with, to compete yeah. with these larger right. tube sites so i apologize for talking so much but um I think that gives us a, a pretty good idea yeah, of some of these issues. Yeah, it's helpful context. And still, at the end of the day, okay, if someone wants to come back and say, okay, well, even if we could find a way yeah. to produce all <laughs> pornographic content, quote unquote, ethically, which is hard to say with a straight face because it truly is absurd. Impossible. If we could produce it and disseminate it in a way that was ethical. And I will just add to that um, something that, is a little complex with pornography is that even if someone were in a situation where they agreed to what was happening, um, they signed a contract, they, they felt okay with consenting to what happened at that time. Um, consent should mean that at any point you can, you can say, actually, no, actually I don't consent to this. And in, in the instance where a video has been recorded and uploaded to the internet, um, performers don't have, performers or someone who's been exploited doesn't have the option of saying, actually, I'd like this video to no longer be on the internet because, because their, their right to consent to that is taken away by a contractor or whatever yes. piece is there. So, which is a whole additional piece of this puzzle that is that really ethical? It's not. Um, but even if we could somehow create this content free of any concerning unethical problems, Porn still has 
all of the other problems that exist with Absolutely. it on the other side of things. And I do think, let's talk about those. Let's reinforce what those are so people well, and maybe really understand that. One more thing to add that yes. actually I didn't mention that's really important is even if all of this could be perfectly ethically produced. Right, which it um, can't. Which it can't. But yeah. if it could. But if it could. The other thing that we are neglecting is that there, because there's a demand for this content and that demand means that that product is yes. going to be created, that yes. content is going to be created, that that means that minors will be exposed to that content. Yes. We know that. Minors yes. will be exposed to pornography because there's a demand for it to be created yes. by adults or whomever, right? Yes. That means minors are being exposed. The other problem with that is anyone who would seek to groom, especially a minor, into mm -hmm. participating in inappropriate, illegal, and unhealthy sexual behaviors, the first thing they're going to you to do is show that minor pornography to normalize the abuse yes. that they will experience yes and the fact that there is a demand you know everyone wants to say this doesn't hurt anybody else right it does the yes. fact that there is a demand for that content to be created means it exists means that someone somewhere can use that yes. same content that is has a demand created for it to groom a minor yes. into participating in illegal unhealthy and inappropriate sexual yes. behaviors we've spoken to many experts who have said so long as there is a demand the supply will need to be created. Yes. And if the demand is for something that people otherwise aren't interested in consenting to because it's so extreme or violent yes. or whatever that may be, then individuals will be often sex trafficked or exploited to meet that demand. So um, real quick, just legally, the definition of sex trafficking is yeah. – um, a commercial sex act induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which someone under the age of 18 is involved. So for anyone who is unaware of how often in the mainstream porn industry, which people think like, oh, it's it's a mainstream industry. They've got their ducks in a row. They're looking out for people. Um, the number of former performers we have heard from who have said in the mainstream porn industry, force, fraud, and coercion happens all of the time. Um, even for people over the age of 18. But also, there is truly no way to guarantee for someone w consuming pornographic content, yeah. especially when the category of teen is yeah. one of the most popular categories and, and porn sites can claim that it's for 19-year-olds or 18-year-olds. Um, but there is content of people who look very young and there is no way to guarantee that that person is of, is age. of legal age to consent um, and even if they were, there is no way to guarantee that there was not force, fraud, or coercion involved. So sex trafficking happens within the mainstream porn industry so much more than anyone knows, um, but also often happens to supply the demand for these extreme forms of content. Um, and then we go from there to the point you're making about how that content can then be used to groom minors and also adults. Um, we interviewed someone who um, told a story of working with um, women who were being exploited in um, brothels, basically, and and how one woman was, was being f uh, forced to engage in sex acts in that brothel while also video was playing, pornography that had been made of her being exploited was playing in that brothel as well to normalize... Um, some of the things that were being done to her as well. So it's like, it just continues to snowball um, when looking at like, how could this possibly be something we could produce ethically? Because there are so many offshoots of these different things of why so it's problems. not possible. Yeah. Yes. And if, uh, I know this is heavy, but if someone wants to uh, have more examples of this or to hear from some of these people, one of the best things you can do is watch our Jane Doe yes. uh, video series. She's going to talk about girls do porn, yeah. uh, which if you're unfamiliar with that, essentially uh, mainstream, and I would even say air quotes again, within the industry, they were, quote, well-respected. Yes. Uh, they were found to have essentially been for years, I believe almost a decade, yes. intentionally seeking out young, naive people, predominantly women, um, who modeled on Instagram, had small followings, things like that, modeled fitness equipment yoga yes. clothing things like that to fly out to participate in fitness photo shoots and yes. instead when they arrived on set they were forced to sign contracts drugged raped held against their will locked in hotel rooms filmed for days on end yeah. and then that content was cut and edited in a way to look like it was consensual yes 
Um, those are the kinds of stories that we're referring to yes. of why this is impossible. Yes. So when we're saying there's truly no way for a consumer to know um, how the content on the other side of something was produced, because it is designed to look a different way, no matter how it's produced. Yes. Um, and just to add to that, you know, many porn sites claim to have age, quote unquote, age verification processes. Um, that as we know from Pornhub removing millions of videos from their site after the Children of Pornhub article in the New York Times, um, those processes are not really um, what they claim the what they claim to be. Yeah. yeah. So absolutely. And I know we've dwelt on this for a long time, yeah. but the, maybe the last thing that we can just say is the the new thing that we're being asked is AI porn. Yes. Right. Like, oh well. Here's all of these issues that you've explained pretty well why ethical porn is not possible, but AI porn will solve all of this. Right. Here's why that's not possible. Correct. Once again, uh, the the biggest thing that people don't understand, I think a lot of people uh, claim to be experts on AI, and I think uh, none of them, except for the people who work for these companies, are experts on yes. AI, including myself. Yes. I'm not an expert, but what I do know is that in order to train one of these models, you have to expose it to the content that you expect it to create, Correct. right? So right now, most of AI has been language models. Now there's photo and video models coming yes. out. In order for it to create this content, it has to process unfathomable amounts of yes. data in order to yes. learn how to recreate these things. So the biggest issue at the heart of AI porn is that aside from the issues I'm sure Natalie will mention in a sure. minute, uh, in order for it to create that content, it had to consume vast amounts of pornography Yes, that all is likely in the same category as what we've just talked about. Yes. Uh, exploitative Yes, content, especially if content. the argument some people are making, which is like, well, if we can artificially create this extreme type of content, then people won't be exploited to be yeah. in it. But that is but the very problem. But for it to learn how to make that, that yes. it had to consume that yes, extreme, the extreme exploitative content. Violent, violent exploitative yes. content to be able to produce that. Yeah. And not to mention that AI or not... Um, this content will further normalize the behaviors that porn already normalizes now. Um, it will fuel objectification of, yeah. of people. It will normalize and perpetuate the idea that people are objects to be consumed rather than yes. people with feelings and yes. thoughts and emotions, especially if we're removing it another degree and saying, well, yes. is this really what it is? And I think that's also worth noting yes. of how problematic that is. So we've talked about a variety of issues with ethical porn and AI technology being used to create pornography. The last thing that I will say is that this content is already and will be used to create child sexual exploitation material, yeah. which is inherently one of the largest problems with this. Yes. Uh, that means, first of all, that that content needs to digest exploited material of children uh, likely right. in order to create that content. And regardless, uh, no form of that content should exist, yes. whether it was made because the AI model learned uh, right. digesting actual child sexual exploitation material or not. Right. That content shouldn't exist, whether the person is even real or even exists or not. That content shouldn't exist. People should not be consuming it. Right. We know what we look at, what we consume, impacts the way we think and treat and behave, and that that over time can shape people's sexual right. desires and just really quickly will you clarify because i think for some some people maybe don't fully understand what ai porn really is yeah that's a great question and i think especially anyone who's heard about deep fakes or or has yes. an understanding of what that is like can you differentiate between the yeah, two yeah absolutely so we have a lot of content on our website about deep fakes because yeah. that technology has been around for longer and it's evolved more yeah. um and we are now creating more content about the issues with AI. So I think yeah. that is a good distinguishment. Uh, in, in my opinion, uh, deep fakes is now already becoming outdated. Yeah. Um, and AI is essentially replacing, replacing it. Yeah. yeah, even though deep fakes is still so young. Deep faking something means that someone is taking, when it, when it relates to pornography, uh, well, deep fakes in general, it means yeah. that someone has enough content of someone uh, which now these deep fake engines have gotten to the point that they don't need that much content right. of someone uh, a social media account usually is enough 
to create content of that person saying and doing things that they've never done. Right. So that technology was pretty quickly adopted in order to create exploitative pornography of right. people who were unwilling and never consented for their material to be used that way, where they could get enough content from someone's social media or photos or videos of an ex-partner or something like that to create content by essentially uh, editing over the face right. of a person in a porn video to be someone else's face, whether that's a celebrity, an ex-partner, right. uh, a stranger, someone on social media, a minor. That is a huge problem. Right. Um, so to clarify, it's taking a real piece of content that exists, yeah, real pornography, a real pornography video, absolutely. and putting someone else's face, putting someone else's on, face in yes, that content in that to make it look like they're in the pornography. Yes. Um, and then when we're talking about AI, essentially this is something that never happened, never existed. Right. But the, for the model to be good enough to create that content, right. it has to digest a lot of pornographic content. Right. So that's where we're kind of distinguishing. We're seeing that this content can be used for very exploitative terms right. because to feed the 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 uh, artificial intelligence enough information for it to create this content, it's already consumed exploitative right. content problematic content that we've already talked about when we we're talking about ethical porn right and then of course um you know everything from celebrities to strangers to ex-partners right. to children like we talked about child sexual exploitation material being able to be created right. with this uh artificial intelligence so things to be aware of for yeah. sure and not to mention that content still normalizes and perpetuates yeah. all of the other problems that porn does yes. regardless of Absolutely. how it's created. Absolutely. Um, and while we're talking about different types of pornography that exist yeah. and with technology changing, um, something else we, we did get asked and get asked often is about other forms of um, erotic content. So, for example, literature um, or increasingly audio kind of audio. Books yes. Or, books. Um, or just audio erotica. Yeah. And um, I will start by saying there's not a ton of research about those forms of pornography. Most of the research that we see is about mainstream pornographic content. Yes. Um, primarily meaning videos and, and images. Um, but uh, from the, the stories we've heard from people, um, that content can have similar effects on consumers as what we've seen from pornography. So it is still something that is an experience someone is having with someone else rather than their partner. Um, it can still have some of those same effects for some people. We've heard from people who have said that can still become a compulsive behavior. Or um, super there normal are, stimulus. Exactly, super normal stimulus. There are still components of what we know that, that can impact that, um, that can impact a consumer of those other forms of pornography in the same way. Um, however, some of the pieces of what we've talked about, especially just now with ethical porn, um, you know, individuals being exploited or something, obviously that's not happening in a fictional literature or something that's being made. So, um, there still are some problems with that. Um, there's still within that content can be normalization of things that are problematic or harmful Absolutely. in nature, um, or are, are violent, these other things. Um, but but I want to be clear that most of the research we refer to is refer referring to mainstream pornographic content. Yeah. Meaning videos that are often violent in nature yes. on popular porn sites or other platforms. Yes. Yeah. But that is a, kind of a segue into another question we had about escaping reality, right? Like essentially what any of these forms of pornographic content are being utilized for by most people is to kind of ex escape reality. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's really easy to use pornography to practice escapism. You know, many yeah. people seek out porn, like we talked about earlier, when they're lonely, stressed, yeah. sad, or bored. And as we discussed, you know, while these emotions aren't always enjoyable, they're normal, natural, and in some instances healthy. Uh, the problem with using porn to avoid uh, these emotions and our lives is it doesn't really help in the long yeah. run, right? So porn is connected to, like we said, poor mental health, lower self-esteem, right. poor body image, less fulfilling relationships, and more loneliness. Right. So we have a few articles on the website that you can check out on this topic. Um, if you're stressed or bo bored or lonely, is porn a healthy outlet for relief? Yeah. I think that's the title of one. Another one is emotional escape fuels porn obsession. Yes. 
Um, so a few options there to dig into this topic a little bit more, but yeah, absolutely. People use pornography as a way to escape from reality, uh, to try to cope with what they're dealing with. Yeah. And we know that that isn't a healthy solution yeah. in the long run. And just um, to add to that, I think too, if you're using pornography to escape reality, it becomes your reality yes. to some degree. So the content that you're seeing that's normalized um, becomes what you believe is reality. And in some cases, um, for example, we there are several stories like this, um, but one we often think about or I often refer to is when we heard at a presentation where um, an individual had been on a first date, had they were 16 or a teenager, um, was on a date and at some point in the date went to kiss their date and choked her and truly did not know what he had done wrong because he thought that's what she would want because that's what he had seen in pornography. Um, and, uh, and those things are happening way more often than anyone any of us would are aware. think. Yes. Yeah. Than any of us are aware. Um, and that's where pornography is setting young people up for failure in a lot of ways because it does not portray, um, realistic and healthy depictions of sex. And so a question we, we get asked about that is like, where, where, well, where can young people learn about healthy sex, uh, other than something that's a form of, form of escapism like pornography? Yeah. That is a great question. So how can we help teens learn about healthy sex? Yes. Uh, all of the parents and adults listening to this podcast, you are probably hoping that we are going to give you this crisp, easy answer. That's right. But the truth is that ultimately it's by having open, honest, yeah. and ongoing conversations yes. with our children. Yes. So. While we wish that there was a pill we could take or something we could watch yeah. or a book we could hand them and it would yeah. just fix all of this, unfortunately, that's not realistic. Yeah. The solution ultimately is being educated ourselves, yes. putting in the work, and then set aside, setting aside a time and a place to have these conversations with our kids, making them yes. feel like it's important, teaching them both our family values and the scientific impacts yeah. of pornography. Um, and realizing, like we mentioned earlier, that this conversation is not, it's not healthy or realistic to think it's all going to happen at once. Yes. This can no longer be the like one time sex talk that maybe some people got and they didn't. Yes. I often joke with parent audiences when I'm traveling around the country and doing presentations, like, you know, my parents never had the sex talk with me. And now I work for a nonprofit and go around speaking to people about porn's harms. If you right. don't want your kid to end up like me, you should probably talk to them about pornography. <laughs> and while, although that is a little bit funny, um, <laughs> It's also kind of true. Like we need to yeah. have these conversations with our kids and we need to recognize that the awkward fumbling through these conversations of the past can't be a solution yes. anymore. And I don't want to make anyone listening to this feel bad as we would always say, but I do want to point out a little bit of an example of why I feel like sometimes we're falling short with these conversations. Yeah. If, if you are a parent you likely have been in a position in your life where you were interviewing for a very important job. And to prepare for that, you learned everything you could about the company. You were prepared to answer questions. You had questions prepared to ask the company. Yes. You likely had some form of a binder or a website or something to demonstrate past work. You'd prepared a resume. You had done so much to prepare for that interview. Yeah. And when we listen to stories from young people, we hear time and time again, that these conversations, at least in part, are awkward simply because the parents aren't fully prepared. Yes. That they could be doing more, right? Yes. If we're doing all of that to prepare for a job interview, we can do the same things to help prepare for these conversations yes. with our kids. We can learn the research and the data. We can be prepared to answer questions, to ask questions, to know where to start and where to end the conversation, yes. uh, how to help our kids, where this conversation can evolve in the future, how to have age-appropriate conversations at a variety of ages, yes. right? Telling a five-year-old that if they're on a device or on a TV or something and something pops up that they don't know what it is, yes. 
that they can talk to an adult, that's not going to take away their innocence. No. That is a perfectly healthy thing age to tell that a, ch- a, a child or a toddler that's age appropriate, yes. right? And that conversation can evolve as those kids mature. So please just be comforted in knowing that there are resources available. Yes. That we have access to more information than ever before and that you can do this. Absolutely. You have the power to have these conversations and that you are the best person to have these conversations yes. with your children. Absolutely. And that this isn't a one-time thing, as you said, it's an ongoing discussion, right? The earlier you can start that in age-appropriate ways, the safer they're going to feel coming to you um, as they age with these questions. Um, And the more comfortable it will be. Often you mentioned parents feeling a little awkward. Um, Parents often feel much more awkward about this than than the young people do. As we mentioned earlier, they know more than you think they know, and they want someone to help guide them through this. So Um, by preparing so that you don't feel uncomfortable as an adult doing your research. It doesn't mean you have to be an expert. You can always say, actually, I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to look it up and get back to you. You don't have to know everything to be able to have healthy and productive conversations. And if your child tells you something you're not expecting, if you are in a place when you hear that, where you're a roller coaster of emotions, please recognize it's okay to perhaps decide, maybe not in every scenario that, Hey, you know what? I'm so glad you told me I love you. Um, can we talk about this more tomorrow? Yeah. Right. So that you can talk to the other parent. Yes. Um, you can be better prepared. You can think about what those consequences need to be. Yes. Right. Um, because ultimately, what's the goal of these conversations? For them to continue happening. Yes. And everyone remembers a time where their parents either found out or we told them something that wasn't ideal. And if they reacted negatively to that, what did we decide? We never. Next time, I'm never going to. I'm not telling them again. again. I'm never going to talk to them again. Right. That's ultimately not the goal in those moments when we feel stressed and anxious and upset. That yeah. sometimes feels like that is the goal. But in reality, the goal is to continue to have these conversations. Yes. And if that means we need to take a step back, tell them I love you, thank you for telling me, and talk to them tomorrow about it or later or whatever that might be, yes. then that's a great step forward. Yes. And something to add to that is, um, you know, research shows, especially around the topic of pornography. Let me back up and just say, Young people having questions about sex is completely yeah. normal and natural. They're curious. Um, the answers they're going to get if they Google this are going to be very different answers than if they come to you and ask you. You want them to come to you and ask yeah. you instead of Googling and finding the information that they will be taught from yeah. pornography that's inaccurate and misrepresentative. Or exactly, or a stranger. So, um, That being said, knowing they're going to come to you, it's really important that you know what research says about shame, which is that especially when it comes to the topic of pornography, shame only perpetuates um, a struggle with pornography or pushes someone back to coping in this way typically. Um, Removing shame from this conversation altogether is going to ensure that you can continue to have those conversations, that they will keep coming back to you and asking these questions. And I say that to add, if you as a parent um, have shame about your own struggle with pornography or around this topic, then that's something good to look at kind of within yourself and address first to be able to remove that barrier for yourself to have these conversations in a healthy and productive way as well. Yeah. And what does that look like to remove that shame? In addition to what Natalie said, you know, um, it means being careful of the language that we use. It means helping them to understand the difference between guilt and shame. You know, guilt says this is an unhealthy behavior. It's impacting myself and other people, but I can change. I'm not alone. I'm not the only person. People love me. I am valued. Things can get better. I can change. I can heal. Right. Uh, whereas shame says I'm broken. I'm bad. Something's wrong with me. I'm the only person like this. No one cares about me. I'm totally alone and this will never get better. Right. And the biggest thing we can do is to help them understand the differences in those things and tell them we love them and work with them through this process. Yes. And that will ensure that they come back to you for these questions and that you can be the one to help them learn not only healthy information about sex, but also healthy and productive ways to navigate these very, very complex and complicated issues that they're dealing with as young people growing up in the digital age, including yes. pornography, well et cetera. And if you're experiencing shame, you're not alone. And, yeah. and we free invite you shame. Yes, yeah. to free yourself of that shame. And there are a lot of resources that can help you or your child who maybe is struggling with pornography. Um, 
And there are resources that can help you learn how to have these conversations. So just a reminder, again, you can go to ftnd.org slash resources um, and you'll be directed to um, articles, videos, documentary, more episodes of this podcast, um, things you can listen to to learn about this, as well as resources to help overcome a struggle with pornography, help you have productive conversations, help you book a live presentation if you're interested in, in bringing us to your community to speak. Um, and then also if you are a survivor of sexual abuse or sexual exploitation, um, if you are struggling with a compulsive habit, um, if you're struggling as a partner of someone, uh, there are resources that can help you, um, no matter how this, this issue may be impacting you. So know that you're not alone, know that there is help. Um, and please visit our website and check out some of those resources and many other resources that are likely available to you locally, wherever you live, um, but also that are, that are out there. Well, we hope that the conversation today, we, especially at the beginning of this covered some difficult topics. Yeah. Um, but we're proud of our fighters for submitting, yes. uh, excellent questions. Like these yes. are things that need clear answers. We're proud of you for submitting those. Yes. We hope that the, the hope at the end of this is that if you go to ftnd.org slash resources, you can find the support you're looking for, whether it's yes. a tool, a resource, a blog, whatever it might be, there has never been a better opportunity to make a change, to get yes. the help you need, to have conversations with your kids. There's never been more help yes. ever before. And just to know that, like, I just want to reinforce, this is something we've heard from countless people who have been in a, a struggle with pornography, who have created change, or um, in it's in, been in a relationship, struggle, exactly. it's impacted their life, and there is hope on the other side of this. Yeah. So if there is one thing you need to hear today, um, please know that your efforts as a fighter matter, your efforts to create change on these issues matter. And um, together, we're going to be able to to create some positive change in the world yeah. on these issues. And maybe if you have more questions that you would like to see us answer in the future, you know, maybe down the road we can do a part two of this. Yeah. Uh, feel free to send us those on social media or email them to us at f- info at ftnd.org. Absolutely. Thanks, Parker. Yeah, thank you. Help us celebrate 15 years of fighting for love by repping the movement in some of our conversation starting gear. From March 15th through the 21st, you can shop everything in our online store for 15% off using code FTND15. It's the perfect time to stock up on your favorite fighter gear. Plus, when you shop, 100% of the proceeds from your purchase supports our mission to educate individuals on the harms of pornography and sexual exploitation. Get your gear before it's gone. Shop our anniversary sale at ftnd.org forward slash shop. That's ftnd.org forward slash shop. Join our community of monthly donors, helping others recognize how porn can impact them, their relationships, and their communities. Join Fighter Club for as little as $10 a month to help us continue our efforts. Visit ftnd.org to learn more. Listen to the following testimonial on how Fight the New Drugs resources help one couple overcome their struggles with porn. Fighter Club has given me hope. I am always needing a reminder that healing is possible and that people can change. No one is stuck watching porn forever. My boyfriend and I have grown so much stronger because of our teamwork, and he is so much healthier and happier now than ever. If it weren't for Fight the New Drug, we wouldn't have gotten the resources that we needed to fight. It has been amazing being on the receiving end of hope, but it is even more fulfilling to be on the giving end. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Consider Before Consuming. Consider Before Consuming is brought to you by Fight the New Drug. Fight the New Drug is a non-religious and a non-legislative organization that exists to provide individuals the opportunity to make an informed decision regarding pornography by raising awareness on its harmful effects, using only science, facts, and personal accounts. Check out the episode notes for resources mentioned in this episode. If you find this podcast helpful, please consider subscribing and leaving a review. Consider Before Consuming is made possible by listeners like you. If you'd like to support Consider Before Consuming or any of the educational resources we shared in this episode, you can make a one-time or recurring donation of any amount at ftnd.org forward slash support. That's ftnd.org forward slash support. 
Thanks again for listening. We invite you to increase your self-awareness, look both ways, check your blind spots, and consider before consuming.